Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome everybody to our third series of oil and gas related webinars for Mendelssohnhausen. Uh, the speaker of today, you see him uh, on your screen as well, is Rodrigo Quintero Benjarrano. Man, what a name. <laughs> what a name. <laughs> And it will be on inline density solutions for liquid uh, hydrocarbons. Rodrigo works in our factory in the uh, an R and D facility in Rheinach, Switzerland, and he is part of the strategic industry group uh, working for Anderson Hauser in oil and gas. But he will he will introduce himself uh, a little bit more later. A very interesting uh, individual, I can tell you. This webinar uh, will last roughly about 45 minutes, 30 minutes presentation, 50 minutes question and answer. Please put them into the chat uh, that you see on your uh, screen as well. Now, before uh, we start in oil and gas, it's very common to, um, to have a small safety moment as well. So uh, I would like to focus this on, uh, on the COVID-19 situation, of course. Please wash your hands on a regular basis. Keep at least six feet or 1.5 meters away from each other. Wear a mask in public. Get vaccinated when you get the opportunity. And make sure that you get uh, you stay in good mental health as well, because that is um, uh, very important. My name is uh, Rob Vermillen. I'm globally responsible for the development of oil and gas within Andersenhausen, and I reside on our production facility campus in Greenwood, close to Indianapolis in the U.S. So before we start, small introduction of uh, of Andersenhausen. Uh, we are a global uh, company. We have roughly about 14,300 MPEs worldwide, and um, and we're very financial stable, both on the sales side as on the uh, on the equity ratio. So we own a lot of uh, what you see from Anderson Housing. We have over 8,000 patents, which is uh, considered to be very innovative, and that's our core business: producing instrumentation and uh, put them into solutions to improve. Uh, the uh, performance of our customers' processes. That's our main job. And with this, I'd like to hand over to Rodrigo so he can introduce himself and the topic of uh, today. Rodrigo, go ahead. Thank you, Rob. So once again, thank you everyone for your time. Thank you for participating in this webinar. Um, once again, my name is Rodrigo Quintero Bejarano. I will put it in a different way. Very German name. <laughs> I'm, uh, as uh, Rob mentioned, I'm an industry manager for oil and gas and solutions as well. I'm graduated from the University of Amsterdam. I have about 50 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. And I've been with Anderson Hauser for about eight years now. So I've been in different facilities and I'm, of course, pretty much always related to the oil and gas industry. Okay, so I'm a Spanish speaker, of course, so I will try to slow down and kind of speak slowly, which actually is very difficult for me. Um, so what we're going to talk today, um, as you can see on my screen, I will turn on my camera just to make sure that uh, uh, the speed on the internet is fine. Uh, but what we see right now today, so we're going to talk about density and why is even the inline density measurement so important for the oil and gas industry. Uh, many customers actually call it liquid analysis or even quality control. Uh, the point is actually this is the most important parameter utilized uh, utilize to classify the physical properties of crude oil and all refined products, for example. So this is the reason why um, the accurate density is very important in the industry. Uh, we see, of course, this kind of uh, requirements all the way in the industry. So let's say from upstream to downstream, uh, on inco incoming crude oil, for example, it's very important for our customers to understand what product they are getting in, what kind of quality they're having. Um, also very important for refineries because they need to take samples for a quick feedback uh, for the refining process, of course. So inline density is very important for them, for them as well. Quality control of LPG and heavy samples is also a big part of that. So if you talk about asphalt, bitumen, and heavy oil. And of course, no, last but not least, converting volume to mass when trading asphalt or bitumen as well. So in the end, our customers are paying for a product with the which they expect to have a certain quality. So that's the reason why, uh, besides of course, all these applications that we see here, why the density parameters are very important for the industry. So what Anderson Hauser has to offer, we have the very known uh, Promas Q, our Coriolis meter for, uh, let's say a premium device, um, which we see on the left side, and it's actually a multivariable flow meter. 
is a multivalent flow meter because it doesn't only give you flow meter, it doesn't give you only flow, sorry, but it gives you as well temperature, density, and viscosity. So what we did actually is that from this device, we already prepare and we uh, make it, let's say, better, uh, more tests and more compensations to have a better density accuracy of 0 0.1 kilograms per cubic meters. And the reason of why we Anderson Hauser started to develop into that direction was pretty much because a requirement of support uh, for our key customers, who they struggle to find an alternative to uh, devices which actually went phase out in the market. Right? So as we know, Solar Tron, which has been the standard, uh, the standard and similar in the, in, in the industry for many years, has been phased out. And of course, many of our key customers didn't have even spare parts or stock available to replace those devices. So they came to us and asked for support, uh, what we could do for them. And that's the reason why we decided to develop the ProMask Q into more that kind of density uh, meter. Of course, we understood that um, that a specific device was phase out, well, let's call it by its name, Solartron, had a specific lens, and our customers were concerned about the replacement procedure, you know, of, let's say the mechanical adjustments. Many of them, of course, are um, very small spaces, spaces like refineries, where you don't have really the, the, the space to do any kind of mechanical, mechanical adjustment or even shut down the operation because it's very expensive. It's very expensive to do that. And they were very concerned about it. So that's the reason why, if you see here, the ProMask is a very compact device, which pretty much will fit everywhere. But we needed to make sure that our customers will have a solution which actually will fit uh, the face-to-face -face lane for uh, the, the solar drone. So we came out with, of course, a couple of solutions. Like you will see here, the Promas Q with the spool piece, where you had the pressure and temperature embed right there. And of course, and retrofit extension, which actually is pretty much the Promas Q with extended pipe line, or a spool pipe, let's say like that. So in that way, we, will, we were able to meet that face-to-face -face replacement where the customers were asking for. So going ahead, actually how the Coriolis meter uh, measure uh, density. So if we see on the, in the image right here, a Coriolis meter contains two band tubes, right? Through which the flow passes. An electro electromagnetic driver system will cause the tubes to vibrate toward and away from each other or their resonant frequency. And the frequency is determined by the tubes stiffness and their mass, of course. So, for example, when no medium is flowing, the tubes will oscillate uniformly. But when there is a medium flowing through the tubes, the tubes will twist proportionally to the flow rate. So then the phase shift occurs between the first and second sensor. So what is going to happen is the sensor will register the oscillation frequency of the tubes, or let's say in another words, more simple to, to understand how often the measuring tubes move back and forth in, in one second, let's say like that. So the oscillation frequency is a direct measurement of the fluid density, while some waves in the phase shift indicate the mass flow. So for example, if you have a tube filled with water will oscillate more frequently than a tube filled with honey, for example, because of course honey has a higher density. So in other words, once the liquid density changes, the oscillation frequency will change as well. But as well, it's very important to mention that the density measurement is not based on the Coriolis effect, but on the vibrating tubes. This is very important to see. So here, of course, you see the video of the tubes vibrating and actually moving back and forth, as explained before. Probably to make it more easy to understand, uh, we will kind of try to, to see how a wave sprinkle sample works. So you have here the spring, and let's say, for example, you will add a mass at the end of the spring, let's say for a one kilograms, right? And once you pull that spring, and he will go up and down, he will create, uh, uh, when he will move up and down, he will create this oscillation as a fixed frequency. And this number of oscillations per time of unit is known as a frequency oscillation. So you see, of course, that here, once the mass and the spring is, oscillating or moving up and down, he is creating this kind of oscillation time, right? Now, on the right side, if you increase the mass of the object, so besides having one kilograms, we add 10 kilograms, then the natural frequency of the object will also change. 
So pretty much when the mass decrease, frequency increases we see here, right? So you see the mass increase here, so you will have a longer or you have fewer, let's say, oscillations per time unit compared, of course, to when the mass is smaller. Right? So this one, of course, we can also uh, kind of comply with our with our uh, with our uh, Coriolis meters. So instead of having a springs, as we saw previously, the vibrating tubes will act like a springs, right? So I don't want to go into the whole calculations to kind of save more time. But uh, if you are, uh, let's say, uh, interested to see how the the hook law spring equation works, you can look it up. But it's pretty much saying that uh, um, this is very much related to a spring um, uh, spring wave, uh, let's say, ten, uh, theory. Sorry, right? So I go pretty much through it. So what we have a typical legacy installation at the moment. So what we're going to encounter in many sites is going to be the Solartron, which you see right here. The Solartron is going to provide a time period signal to the flow computer. And this time period signal is pretty much a density row. What it means in density row is a no compensated uh, density. Then you will have, of course, the temperature and pressure embedded into the flow computer. The flow computer, of course, has the API tables, and he will do the compensations to provide, of course, the reference density according to API 11.1. Also has to pay, take into account that key factors per individual mirror has to be entered into the flow computer to make the compensation as discussed. Has to be, uh, this has to be very clear. As we mentioned here, only compensation for fluid temperature and, presses, and pressure is done. So it means that any kind of external influence in the device or in the, let's say, in the medium will not be taken into account, right? So what exactly is a time period signal? So it's very much uh, what we, we mentioned before, density is very much related to the row frequency of the, of the device. And that's the reason how they, uh, let's say, bring this uh, frequency direct so related to the density. <clears throat> so what they do is pretty much they convert the TSP, so the signal, to the density and reference density. But this is performed at the flow computer. So the Solartron will only provide this TSP or row density into a flow computer. And the flow computer is the one who will do the complete, uh, uh, let's say, calculation. Of course, as we mentioned, this approach is not optimal because the flow computer only compensates density for fluid and pressure, sorry, for fluid pressure and temperature. And no, as I mentioned before, for many other factors that can actually have influence on the accuracy of the density, right? Most of these devices, you will have a very good performance only in water, right? Uh, and even only in pretty much in, in the factory lab labs. Because of course the conditions there are perfect. They are not the real conditions what we will find with customer side. <clears throat> so this is pretty much a sample of the generic table that we see as a as a let's say as a key factor who are entering the flow computer to do the calculations. So you will see here, for example, adjust on density uh, with different units, of course, uh, density plus temperature, pressure, and so on. So this is pretty much always embed into the flow computer for further calculations. So what is new and different with the PROMAS Q? Well, besides compensating the time period signal, as we discussed about it, we also design a vibration tubes in a different way that we will explain later. Aging of sensor tubes for additional density stability, and of course, additional density calibration points for temperature and a wider range of temperature uh, uh, calculation, let's say like that. So just an example, uh, we had a customer in, in the Scandin Scandinavian countries where he had issues with the instrument installed in a cabinet. As we know, of course, in the Scandinavian countries are, are kind of cold. It gets pretty cold, I would say, in the winter. And he told us with all the time when he opened the cabinet, the density changed a lot. And of course, he find out uh, the, the device installed at that time didn't have any compensation for external temperature changes. And that's the reason why we do all these uh, compensations. Because and if we don't do that, of course, many customers will have that issue uh, with the ambient or external influence or external temperature changes in the device. 
of course, that means that for customer benefit, you will have less errors and of course the measurement, right? So once again, what we compensate, of course, we have inside the Promas Q uh, external pressure transmitters, it can be also manual fixed pressure values, of course. Uh, you will see that we have, of course, RTDs or temperature from internal and external as well. We compensate for a flow velocity, orientation, and of course, viscosity, which is patented by Anderson Hauser and entertain gas. That's something that we will, of course, look as well in the technology, how this applies to, to, uh, to the PROMAS-Q. So for example, uh, we see here uh, that we compensate for a uh, job modulus. Job modulus is pretty much related to elasticity and tension. So as we know, the temperature has an influence on mechanical components, right? So it can make actually uh, the device change, uh, or the, let's say the tubes, for example, if we didn't have this compensation, the tubes on the Coriolis will kind of be affected, will be kind of, uh, uh, the structure will be affected. So adding this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, compensation for, uh, for job models, for example, this will help us to compensate for the slight change and tube stiffness, for example, which is caused by temperature. <clears throat> Process pressure as well. So as we know, pressure induces span effects and, and they're pretty much flow rate independent. And what they, uh, they do actually is an, the internal uh, pressure will, uh, let's say, have a direct impact in the tubes that will make it more rigid to vibrate or to, let's say more hard to vibrate and which actually will have a direct direct effect in the, the, the meter signal, of course, you know? Because of course, as we mentioned before, we relate too much on the vibration uh, of, the, of the tubes. And if, of course, the pressure will have an impact on, on the way that the tubes move, then of course, we will have uh, no high accuracy device. It's always recommended to have a tra traceable dynamic light pressure correction uh, via pressure transmitter, of course. So that's the reason we do that. And we, of course, do a different, uh, let's say, simulation or structural simulation to see how our device will comply with different kind of uh, pressure, um, let's say, pressure um, uh, increase or something like that, as you can see right here. Okay, go ahead. Because we know air gravity has a big impact in any object, even in Coriolis meters. So that's the reason why it's very important for us uh, to have a very, uh, let's say, to communicate with the customer how the installation should be done, how to install the device in the best way. And we have, of course, this automated compensation, which is called a pitch angle and roll angle. And you will see here, of course, how we tell our customers to install the device, how to do that. And they will help us, of course, to have no influence for gravity. We have, of course, not only on the installation of the device, but internally of the instrument, we have a measuring tubes, which actually are as well compensate to make sure that we don't have any influence uh, from uh, the gravity, for example. Besides that, of course, forces and vibrations. This is very critical as well, because for example, if you have a valve or any instrument, which is very close to a, to a measuring device, and you don't do a compensation against this, this kind of external vibrations, this will affect, of course, the accuracy a lot. And, and to have the ability to offer specific working frequencies will give us a benefit to avoid this kind of external influence already in the field. So that's the reason we have, of course, as well, structural simulations to see how these forces, how this vibration will affect our device. And we, of course, based on that simulation, we add all these kind of parameters to compensate and make sure that actually the device is working fine and not having issues with external influence, like vibrations, as I mentioned, which are typically at low frequencies. Something very important, of course, is what we mentioned before, multi-frequency technology, how it works. So for a Coriolis to work perfectly, I will try to put it in an easy way, the fluid must move synchronized with the motion of the measuring tubes, right? which means both the center of the mass move in the same way. So any kind of bubbles and train in the liquid will affect the, the availability, of course, of the liquid to follow the oscillation of the tubes. So 
what means is pretty much different movement in the center of the mass. So what we do here is with the multi-frequency technology, the same dual tubes are oscillating at two different frequencies, or both simultaneously, as we can see here. So these two are, uh, let's say, doing in a different frequency. So while the coronary matter itself is measuring the same fluid with the amount of force entertained gas, the way those two modes react to this gas entertained will be significantly different. And of course, once we had that information from both, uh, let's say, sensors, then we're able to analyze the results and analyze the resonance properties of the modes, and then we're able to effectively activate the compensation mode to make sure that there is no errors with the entertained gas. Right? So we can see here, of course, um, uh, let's say, how it, it works. Of course, if you, if you require more information about multi-frequency technology, which actually will be a, a very much uh, um, presentation by his own because it requires a lot of time to explain how it actually works. And we have actually videos on YouTube and you will be able to understand more about the multi-frequency technology. Okay. So, so when we talk about the existing uh, devices installed in the, in the market or what actually our customers are encountered with, is we have different scenarios. So the first scenario will be, of course, to replace the solar drone, to maintain the cabling as it is. So that means that temperature will be going into the flow computer. Pressure could be either going to the flow computer or to the PROMAS queue. And of course, we will provide the TPS signal, but compensated, so density compensated. Compensated with all what I just told you about it, uh, where the device is going through, right? And of course, the flow computer will provide the reference density according to API 11.1. Once again, if we do that kind of replacement, then the generic key factor needs to be again included in the flow computer, right? Because here we are just providing the density compensated, but it's still a TPS signal. Here is another way, so a scenario two, which is pretty much using modus, Modbus through a flow computer. So you have pretty much the promise queue as a digital converter. So you have the pressure and temperature directly connected to a promise queue. And a promise queue will provide, of course, via Modbus, the density already compensated, pressure and temperature as well. Once again, the flow computer is the one who will carry on uh, the compensation and will provide the reference density according to API 11.1. So this is another S scenario uh, the customer can actually choose from. And last but not least, we have uh, another, let's say, a solution which actually is a mode boost without a flow computer. How we can do that? Well, as you know, the flow computer has the API tables embed in their system, right? So that's how they calculate with those tables, how they compensate. We have the API tables included or embed in our Coriolis meter, right? So it's kind of a little flow computer inside right here on the Promise queue what we call petroleum package. So you will be able to add the pressure and temperature right away in our instrument. And our instrument, of course, will give you the output of the reference density according to API 11.1, so pretty much what the flow computer is going to do. And it will give you by Modbus pressure and temperature as well. Right. So this one is, of course, and we see for, for Greenfields projects where the customer don't want to spend uh, extra money on a flow computer because he don't see the point to have it then of course, this is a, a great way to go forward, right? So you avoid all the uh, spare parts or, or installation of flow computer, and you have one single device will provide you all the information you need. So how the installation will look like, of course, uh, let's say the standard one will be, uh, you have the, the promise to install in the main pipeline with the pressure behind, behind it, of course, which will provide the pressure to our promise queue for API calculations, or even can be done as a bypass, as we see here, with a retrofit solution. So that means you have, of course, the promise queue, temperature and pressure, and you have, of course, a flow computer, which will do the compensations according to API. If you want to, of course, find more information about this solution, we have a specific, uh, let's say, a brochure about it, and you can contact a local sales partner and they will provide you that information as well. 
So this is pretty much a, a few, few references we have uh, because many customers ask, is it working? Real life is working. So we see here actually one installed on a customer site. So you see how actually how the Promas queue is installed just for density measurement. Here we have a very nice business case and uh, where we have actually our Promas X. So our Promas X is a high capacity flow meter, uh, which actually is a duty meter and in combination with our Promas Q, which you see right here as a densimeter. So this is a pretty much a cheap unloading application. This is very important, of course, because the customer is receiving a lot of products. You can imagine it's a high, capa a high capacity line. So he wants to make sure that actually the product that he's receiving is the quality he's expecting or the quality he's paying for. And that's the reason why having here the Promas Q will provide you the live data right away. And he can see actually he can control what uh, product he's receiving. Also an application in the US. So refine hydrocarbons density. So it's a refinery to pipeline density grading. You can see here, of course, the parameters. Uh, density range from 30 to 75 API. So you see the products that we actually are in there. And uh, the issue was actually the system decimer, decimer, sorry, the system uh, decimeter was no working properly, right? So pretty much out of specifications. And once they stole the Promas Q as a decimeter, the accuracy delivery is 0.1 kilograms for all fluids and service. So once again, what we do with all the compensation from our device is to make sure that actually in real life, on, in the real world, as we call it, the uh, specifications are committed to our customer. So of course, one of the most important points of this, uh, let's say, presentation is the third-party results, uh, because of course we wanted to make sure that everything we do in our Promas queue, all these kind of compensations are delivering what we promise to our customers. So we did, of course, a test uh, ACE and D physical in the UK. So you can see actually it tested with several fluids at 25 degrees, uh, different densities and viscosities, of course, and compensate viscosity effect as well. So you will see here on the right side, all the products. Here you will see the fluids, density, and here you will see the density deviation. So you can see all the products, different products are exactly inside the specification, 0 0.1 kilograms. And of course, it's independent from a fluid density. So we have different densities. It doesn't matter. We always uh, pretty much stay in the tolerance on our customer. As we said before, our Promas Q is viscosity independent, and we can see pretty much in this test as well that we have different kind of, uh, uh, again, products with a different viscosity, and you see the deviation was pretty much as well as promised 0 0.1 kilograms. So it doesn't matter what density, it's still inside the specifications. So here, of course, we did with water. So this is water, and here you have the fluid pressure. So you have, of course, uh, five bars, then we increase it to 55 bar, and then to 95 bar. So you can see pretty much also inside the specifications, what we call. Another, let's say, test. This one is the Senam, Mexico. So they pretty much do a, com a comparison between the Promas Q with Anton Par. And of course, you can see the calibration and the, uh, let's say, errors. So you can see, of course, the Promas Q is always inside the uh, specifications, while the others don't. Right? So it's very, very, very important to understand as well. And last but not least, uh, there's a WIB uh, test where actually they compare the Anderson Hauser Promas Q densimeter versus the Solartron densimeter. Right? So the DIA comparison, the DIA report on how uh, the two densimeters perform, let's say like that. And if you want to have more information about this report, you can have it from our local Anderson Hauser code that as well. So you can receive a copy from the report and you will see what is the outcome from that, uh, let's say testing from Promas Q versus the Solartron densimeter. So once again, we do all these tests and all this uh, compensation just to make sure that our device are independent of fluctuations, process conditions, like I told you, and of course, the accuracy is guaranteed in the real world. 
right? And I will say this is for the moment the presentation. I think I, I made it good on time. And if you have any question, of course, I believe right now is the time for, for questions, right, Rod? Seri, yes, there is. This is time for questions. We have a lot of questions, Rodrigo. Great. Um, but before we uh, we go to the questions, uh, mm -hmm. I like to uh, point out to the handout on on the right hand side of your screen, where you um, get uh, most of the uh, the slides that Rodrigo has been presenting over uh, the last half hour. Um, the question I have a lot of questions. This is unbelievable. So I will uh, go through that uh, a little bit uh, as well, as far as possible. Uh, if we run out of time, don't worry. Uh, Rodrigo or myself will uh, will contact you and uh, give you the answers to the questions that you have uh, you've posted, and and go from there as well. And might you have questions after the fact? Uh, please do not hesitate to uh, contact either Rodrigo. You see his email address on your screen. Or myself, um, it's more or less the same. It's rob.formulen at andres.com. We have very simple email addresses um, and we'll get back to you uh, as soon as we can. So, with that, I like to um, go to the questions, Rodrigo. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, one of the first questions we got one Are you guys calibrating with water or actual hydrocarbons? We do it with water and, of course, a not really a, a, a different hydrocarbons, but a different, uh, let's say, liquids, but no hydrocarbons. Okay, so you do it with with uh, re reference liquids uh, and with uh, with water. Exactly. Okay. But once once again, the third party test that you saw is done with real hydrocarbons, as we as we showed previously. So the relationship between uh, that we did from the testing between the water and the hydrocarbons is very, very good. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't get those results. Exactly. Yeah. That, the next question that's was, um, does this Coriolis meter work as good on liquefied natural gas as it does on oil? Well, for LNG, as we call it, liquid natural gas, um, it has to work as well as a, a, as a oil. Uh, you mean like the same accuracy or, or same performance? What exactly? I, I don't know. That this is the question don't say, but um, I think it has to do with accuracy. Well, the accuracy is different uh, from oil to, to, of course, to LNG. And, uh, the, and of course, we expect to have the same, uh, let's say, uh, kind of, um, how we call it, performance. But, but of course, as we know, LNG is a different medium. Uh, it's a it's a cryogenic medium, so of course it's never going to be the same as the oil, at least at the moment. Yeah, I think so too. API has also different tables uh, for mm -hmm. uh, for cry, um, cryogenic uh, applications as well, uh, mm -hmm. as they do for oil, of course. Huh? Mm -hmm. So the next question, uh, this is an interesting one though. Uh, it's from Anidi. Uh, please, how often is the instrument validated? What we say is actually pretty much what. If you have a Solartron, it's pretty much what you used to do with Solartron. We recommend maybe once a year, you know. Uh, but of course, it's spreading to the customer. If the customer do it once a year and he see that the instrument is pretty much always uh, spot on, let's say like that, then probably he will extend uh, the, the calibration procedure, maybe two years or three years, but it's depending on the customer, you know. That's yeah, no the application, definitely. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. There's no standard procedure who will tell you do it every six months or every year, you know. So it's based on. Uh, of course, once a year we recommend it, and once the customer get experience on how the instrument is performing, how spawn on it is, then of course he made his right decision, let's say like that. Yeah, it also um, uh, relates a little bit to the question of, uh, of Richard as well. And he's asking uh, what calibration is required with these meters? Are there other instruments used to confirm working correctly? Well, what we use, of course, uh, we use the instruments inside the device, but it doesn't really do into the own calibration procedure. So if you talk about temperature or pressure uh, transmitters in the device, it doesn't really uh, make part of the uh, calibration procedure for density, you know? Um, so what you can do, of course, as recommended by APIs, external, external pressure, of course, 
on the production where you actually can uh, um, verify yourself, but pretty much it's known known another instrument, just the just the Coriolis, let's say like that. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. we had a similar question also for Anidi uh, with regards to uh, how you do that, but I think that's um, that's a that's a big uh, big uh, answer to give. I think so. We maybe we should uh, do that offline and um, or make another webinar out of it. We can do that too, uh, uh, Rodrigo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how to calibrate uh, for density and for flow because it's a very interesting topic, uh, but it's yeah. not so easy. Yeah. So yeah, then definitely. we have one more question. It's an interesting one as well, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. What is the interface application of the instrument with regards to IIoT? So do you have digital interfaces uh, next to the uh, Modbus and the and the heart and the 4 to 20 milliamp uh, that's normally coming out of these instruments? <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually a very good question. Um, as you know, I mean, depends how you call it IoT, because that question always comes what the consumer means with IoT. But of course, what we say is we have our sensors have uh, this, um, let's say, this uh, ability to have this, uh, what we call heartbeat technology, let's call it like that. So the ProMask has a heartbeat technology with a cell diagnostic device. So he's pretty much checking out himself if the sensors are working fine, is there inside the specifications, or if there is a problem with the medium uh, inside the sensors. So it's part of, I, I would call it part of IoT, it's a star, because the device is becoming smarter itself. Uh, the device will tell you exactly how the sensors are working, if they have any issues with the sensors, or if it has an issue with the medium. So mm -hmm. some is part of the IoT journey, I would call it like that. Yeah, you have to um, you have to define what it is and what you expect, uh, exactly, exactly want out of it as well, in, exactly. a, in, a, in a way. Huh? So but what exactly you mean by IoT? Sorry. Yeah, no, exactly. So for me, it's important because many customers have IoT uh, meaning the different situation, you know? Uh, and, and I say, okay, everybody has to really um, come clear to see what IoT or what the spec from the device. Like I said, from a device, you can have the, the smartness device that actually do a cell diagnostic, a cell check, and it will tell you if the sensors are working fine or if there's any issue with the medium or not. So there's already a step forward into that kind of direction. Yeah, we have, by the way, also some webinars on that topic. So uh, please look at the uh, at the amount of webinars uh, that we have on this topic and pick your pick with regards to that as well. Then yeah. um, this is also an interesting question. It's from uh, Panayotis. Um, my Greek is not so good, I think. I can see that in slide 30, 32 that the installation of Coriolis is 45 degrees, but in slide 20, you are showing 90 or 180 degrees. Can you please clarify what kind of installation is uh, the best? Muswan, can you mention once again the 30 what? Yeah, it's slide 32. Yeah, 30. And then also slide 20. But the slide 20 have, I don't know if I'm, and the slide 20 had the fluid temperature, uh, compensation on you models. But I think the question, uh, Rodrigo, is more about what is the ideal way of mounting a Coriolis meter uh, for density solutions? Yeah, it depends on the application that we saw in the pictures, of course. It depends on the customer space. So, like maybe. The, our, our, our customer saw there is one mounted 45 meter, uh, 45 degrees, for, of course. There is one straight, uh, but I would say it's pretty much related to uh, the customer space, of course, and following, of course, uh, uh, the specification of the installation of the Promas cube, the normal Coriolis meter. You know, when you have a liquid, of course, that we want to have belly down, or so on, you know. But I would say it's pretty much related to the customer space. And, and if you are 45 degrees or it's pretty much flat laid down, it, it, that should not be an issue. No, it's not an issue, but you have to be very careful and not to uh, make sure that you entrap air um, inside mm -hmm. the tubes or entrap a lot of solids uh, inside mm -hmm. the tubes as well. So having it at an angle or upside down is probably the best way to go. But mm -hmm. like 45 degrees uh, is an ideal situation as well. 
try mm -hmm. to avoid accumulation of solids and try to avoid accumulation of gas. That gives you the best results, definitely. Okay, then let me see. I have so many more questions, unbelievable. Um, oh, somebody's asking for more um, webinars on flow applications, uh, uh, Rodrigo. Interesting, yeah, why not? Why not? We should do that, yeah, definitely. Uh, let me see. Uh, please share uh, share the certificate of attendance and local contact in uh, if we have a facility in Nigeria. We can answer that question uh, offline. There is no issue there at all. We have that. Okay. Oh, that's uh, more collaboration questions. Oh my. We need to have another webinar calibration. Collaboration is good. <laughs> yeah, it's very complicated. Okay, good. I think uh, that I've answered uh, most questions uh, directly. The rest we will answer, like I said, offline or, for, um, or organize it um, a separate webinar uh, to address these. Uh, any last words, uh, Rodrigo? Uh, let me put the camera on right now just to make sure. Well, I mean, first of all, I want to thank everyone for taking the time and participating in the webinar. I know many people are already tired of computer or digital meetings, but I would say this way we can actually want to bring the technologies. We want to bring the know-how for Anderson Hauser, uh, let's say worldwide, what we can do for our customers. And for me, it's very important to understand that what we do always uh, related to innovation of, of technology or solutions is pretty much always with customer in mind. You know, So if you see why we can uh, with the Promise Q, for example, Densimeter, it's pretty much to help our customers with that, uh, to let's say, come up with alternatives because of the phase out Solartron, you know? So uh, we always had the customer in mind and we always develop our best products and invest in innovation just to make sure that we cover those issues with our, for our customers. That was a, a, a lot of last few words, but you're Spanish, <laughs> so it's okay, apparently. Yeah, it always go like that. <laughs> Good. Sorry. I have some last words as well. I like to uh, uh, have everybody stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and also uh, remain sane uh, with all these crazy times that we're having at the moment as well. That would be a good thing. So we have more um, webinars coming up. Uh, please uh, stay tuned. Um, look at our website for more information on the topic and the times. Normally, it's every Thursday, um, same time, same place um and uh, but a new topic so with that i like to uh, end this webinar thank you very much for con contributions and all your questions and your time spent and i hope you like it have a great day thank you thank you